thank you as well to the Kingston Tenants Union, whose co-founders first came to us with the idea of hosting Sam here for an event. We, like most others here in this room, have been paying close attention to the housing and development issues here in Kingston. We know that rents are rising and there is an extreme shortage of long-term rental properties available in Kingston. Affordable housing projects like Energy Square and the Alms House are in the works, but we also know that the Kingstonian, a proposed apartment and boutique hotel complex proposed for just a few blocks away, is slated to have no affordable housing and will be marketed as high market rate, despite the fact that many current Kingston residents will not be able to afford it and will still struggle to find safe and affordable places to live. Conversations about these topics happen every day here at Rough Draft, whether it's developers meeting about their ongoing projects or policymakers meeting with concerned constituents. As a new business and as relatively new members of the Kingston community ourselves, we also know that we're a part of the changes that have affected things like market value, rents, and housing availability. That's why the Kingston Tenants Union thought, and we agreed, that this could be a good venue to host a discussion like this. When the Kingston Tenants Union came to us with a proposal for this event, we realized that being a bookstore that frequently hosts authors and readings, this could be a valuable way for us to contribute to the discussion. We hope that after tonight, you all feel the same way. In a minute, uh, we're going to turn the microphone over to Samuel Stein, author of Capital City, Gentrification and the Real Estate State. He's going to read a bit from his book, summarize the main points throughout, and then be joined by Betsy Crott of the Kingston, Kingston Tenants Union for a conversation and audience Q&A. First though, a quick word about our shop. We are a fully operating bookstore, bar, and coffee shop, and we are in a big open space. We ask that if you're on this side of the room, you give the speakers the attention and quiet they deserve. And if you're here for the event, please understand that you may hear some noise over on that side of the room as our bar continues to operate. We also have Capital City here for sale this evening for 10% off the cover price. And there are copies located up at the front table as well as here on the coffee table. Copies can be purchased up at the register or added to an open bar tab. And we are sure Sam would be happy to sign copies after tonight's discussion has concluded. Last but not least, we know that this is a passionate topic for everyone involved. We invited developers, policymakers, and the general public here to, to be part of this discussion. And we plan this event as a conversation. We ask everyone here to speak and to listen to others with empathy and respect. With that, we'll close by saying thank you again for being here. And please take this opportunity to learn engage and keep the conversation going. Samuel Stein. Hi, thank you so much um, to Rough Draft for having me, to the Kingston Tenants Union for inviting me. Thank you all for being here. This is a really wonderful turnout. Um, it's an important issue everywhere, but I know it's um, especially roiling right here in Kingston. Um, so my name is Sam or Samuel Stein. Um, I wrote this book that came out a few months ago. Um, I have a background in labor and tenant organizing and research, um, as well as city planning and now geography. And so I kind of combined all those things together in writing this book, um, which is about the housing crisis that you're all so familiar with here, but really is um, a phenomenon that's happening in cities, certainly around the state, around the country, and even around the world, though in very different ways in different places. So towards the beginning of the book, I give a few statistics to kind of paint a picture of the housing crisis, and, and I'll share um, some of those numbers with you. So when I was writing this, um, 2016 was a year of record high home sales and record low home ownership. Um, a record high number of home sales went to uh, absentee landlords and investors, uh, 36%. And some of that is 
uh, especially seniors who are looking for a retirement strategy in this country that doesn't have a strong public uh, um, pension system, but a majority of it is uh, private equity firms like Blackstone, which is the world's largest landlord, buying up housing um, all over the country and all over the world uh, and trying to turn a profit off of it. Uh, so in the last couple decades, rents, uh, move-in rents, asking rents have more than doubled, and at the same time, wages have been relatively stagnant, especially for the bottom half of the labor pool. So we're seeing extreme rent burdens, rent burdens being the amount of people's income that they're paying out in rent. In a lot of cities, and I understand Kingston included, a majority of renters are considered uh, rent burden or living in housing that they can't afford. Um, the federal government marks housing affordability at 30% of your income. So a majority of Kingston tenants are paying more than that. Um, and there's a really highly stratified uh, racial component to this. So in, you know, our country it remains highly segregated. In predominantly white neighborhoods, the average rent burden is 31%. So already we're above the threshold of what's considered affordable. The average uh, tenant is paying 31% of their income in rent. In predominantly African-American neighborhoods, the average is 44%. 44% of people's income going to rent. In predominantly Latino neighborhoods, it's 48%. And then there's another category of people who we call extremely rent burden who are paying a majority of their income in rent. In New York City, where I live, that's more than two million people. And you can think of that every single month as an enormous cash transfer from a renter's boss to their landlord. And they don't get to see um, more than half of their income. And so as a result of this, we're also seeing homelessness rising. Uh, the year that I wrote this book, it was estimated that 2 million people would experience homelessness at some point um, during that year in this country. And another 7 million people are housing insecure. They're uh, like doubled or tripled up in places that are too small for their households. Um, they are couch surfing. Um, we've seen a rise in something called shift bed housing, which was a thing in the industrial revolution and then went away for a long time and is now coming back. Shift bed housing is when you don't rent an apartment, you don't rent a room, you don't even rent a bed in a room, you rent a bed for a few hours in a room and then another worker comes in and places you after that. So we've really seen a skyrocketing of housing costs that isn't coming anywhere close to people's income. And there's a lot of ways to explain what's going on um, with the gentrification of our cities. And I think the predominant explanations are a mismatch between supply and demand. Uh, there is, there's not enough housing for the people who want to live in a particular place. Uh, it's certainly true if we're talking about not enough housing that people can afford. Uh, though in a lot of cities, not this one, there is also a great deal of, of vacant um, apartments. So there is actually plenty of places, there's just no one who's allowed to move into them because someone is holding onto them to sell for a higher price later on. The other big explanation is demographic shifts. Um, talking about uh, you know, the, the baby boom and where those people wanted to live and then the next generation of workers kind of wanted to live in the cities instead of the suburbs. And so then you have this demographic flip where richer people are moving into the cities and poorer people are moving into the suburbs. Yes, that's totally happening, but that doesn't explain why it's happening. That's just uh, kind of a manifestation. So the, the factor that I wanted to focus on in this book is um, a surplus of capital invested into real estate. There is a whole lot of money that is premised on uh, housing costs going up and up and up. And even more fundamental to that, land costs going up and up and up. So at this point in world history, um, a majority of the world's capital, 60%, is invested in real estate. And the only other times we've seen that in the history of capitalism is when that money has been invested in agricultural land for mass production. That's not what we're talking about. 75% of the money that's invested in real estate is invested in housing. And the vast majority of that is in cities. So it's urban real estate that is driving the global economy in a way, certainly the, the investment side of the global economy. 
So it's $217 trillion that's invested in real estate. That's trillion with a T. And you can think of that as the value of all the gold that's ever been mined anywhere in the world times 36. That's how much global real estate is worth right now. So after describing some of those um, statistics, I wrote in the introduction, the force behind these trends is the growing centrality of urban real estate to capital's global growth strategy. Through this process, the price of land becomes a central economic determinant and a dominant political issue. The clunky term gentrification becomes a household word and displacement an everyday fact of life. Housing becomes a globally traded financial asset, creating the conditions for synchronized bubbles and crashes. Government, particularly at the municipal level, becomes increasingly obsessed with raising property values and redistributing wealth upward through land and rents. Real estate developer Donald Trump becomes first a celebrity and ultimately a president. Taken together, we witness the rise of the real estate state, a political formation in which real estate capital has inordinate influence over the shape of our cities, the parameters of our politics, and the lives we lead. The real estate state is not new, nor is it all-encompassing, like the carceral state, the warfare state, the welfare state, or the administrative state. It is an expression of government, a component, a block, a manifestation, a tendency that has been around in one form or another for as long as states and private property have existed. Landowners have been determining the shape of our cities for centuries, and the idea of housing as a commodity even as a financial asset, is not exactly state of the art. What is relatively new, however, is the outsized power of real estate interests within the capitalist state. As real estate values have risen to absurd heights, so has the political force of real estate capital. The real estate state is a feature of government at all levels, from the hyper-local to the global. It is most firmly grafted onto municipal politics, however, because that is where much of the capitalist state's physical planning is done. City planners, therefore, sit uncomfortably at the center of this maelstrom. Planners manage the levers of urban change and make crucial decisions about land use, transportation, housing, the environment, and more. Though most people have no idea what they actually do, planners have an immense impact on both capitalists and workers in cities and suburbs. In most places, planners are tasked with the contradictory goals of inflating real estate values while safeguarding residents' best interests. Capitalism never made planning easy. Organized money could always thwart the best laid plans. But today's urban planners face an existential crisis. If the city is an investment strategy, are they just wealth managers? This book is about planners in cities run by real estate. It describes how real estate came to rule and what planners do under these circumstances. Planners provide a window into the practical dynamics of urban change, the way the state both uses and is used by organized capital, and the power of landlords and developers at every level of government. They also, planners, possess some of the powers we must deploy if we ever wish to reclaim our cities from real estate capital. Understanding uh, planners is an important way to understand the capitalist state, how it is built, and what it would take to dismantle it. And then I write about uh, New York specifically and who I am. I'm going to skip a little. Planning today is defined by incredible dreams and stultifying realities. A planner's mission is to imagine a better world, but their day-to-day -day work involves producing a more profitable one. They almost universally espouse a commitment to pluralism and diversity, but the profession is 58% male and 81% white, demographics that are way out of step with the residents of the cities where most planners work. Though most planning offices are structured to build continuity across changing administrations, planners are still beholden to politicians and their political appointees. Their agendas almost always tend to favor their most powerful supporters, a group that usually includes some strain of real estate capital. And while planning is a public function, Planners in capitalist cities are always at the mercy of the market, since most of what they do is regulate private actions. The money planners have to work with is largely derived from property taxes, an arrangement that incentivizes developer and homeowner-friendly policies 
and restricts the amount of land that is given over to truly public uses. A private land market is essentially a spoiled system. Whoever owns the land keeps the accrued benefits, whether or not the owner is responsible for them. Until land is socially controlled, those who possess property, capital, and access to power will shape planning priorities. With so much global capital invested into real estate, planners are facing enormous pressure to stoke land markets and enable gentrification. Their charge is to find creative ways to raise property values, either because they are low and landowners want them higher, or because they are already high and city budgets will fail if they start to fall. Any seemingly technical discussions of growth, density, or urban form are always also shaped by this imperative. Planners are not just shields to real estate, though. They can and generally want to make spaces more beautiful, sustainable, efficient, and sociable. But without control over the land, the result of their work is often higher land prices, increased rents, and ultimately displacement. As some places endure this kind of land market inflation, others fall prey excuse me, to disinvestment. Their land loses its exchange value, their residents are shut out of credit markets, and their buildings fall into dangerous disrepair. This leads to a landscape of radically uneven geographical development between capital flush cosmopolitan centers like New York and London and investment scare cities like Camden, New Jersey or Blackpool on, um, on England's Irish Sea coast. Even within cities, the same equalities are often evident from neighborhood to neighborhood. Gentrification cannot be a universal phenomenon. Money tends to come from one place and go to another, creating chaos on both ends. On the disinvested side, communities face terrible choices. Many want the benefit of good planning, safe streets, clean air, decent housing, but not the catastrophic tide of capital it summons. In these places, residents will often reject planners' interventions out of a well-founded fear that they will be kicked out of their neighborhoods before they ever enjoy the promised improvements. One recent example. In March 2017, New York State Governor Andrew Cuomo announced a major new initiative for the poorest parts of Brooklyn. The plan promised jobs, parks, health uh, healthcare, and housing at a cost of $1.4 billion. But Brownsville resident Dayon Hopkins was skeptical. He already had been displaced from Bedford-Stuyvesant after that neighborhood started to gentrify. Pointing to an ordinary building, he told a New York Times reporter, they'll take this right here and put a glass door, a brick wall on one side of the hallway, and now it's a law. And now it costs way more than the people are making around these parts. And I understand, it does get nicer, but where's everybody gonna go? Down south? Where are we gonna go? Hopkins says what most planners won't, that as long as some people's business is to profit off land and property, most people will not be able to enjoy the benefits planners promise. Of course, it doesn't have to be this way. We can imagine a better world, and in fact, we must. First, however, we need to understand how we got here and how the system works. I wrote this book for anyone who is frustrated with both the directions their cities are taking and the alternatives planners are offering. I put planners at the center of the story because they are uniquely positioned at the nexus of state, capital, and popular power. On their own, however, planners cannot unwind real estate's grip over our politics. For that, we need organized people, mass movements to remake our cities from the ground up and gain control over our homes and lives. So uh, from there in the book, I talk about the history of urban planning and kind of how we got to this point. I talk about the specific mechanisms of urban planning that are used either intentionally or unintentionally to um, activate real estate values and promote gentrification. Then I look at what I call New York's bipartisan consensus, uh, because 21st century New York has been this great case study in which we had two mayors, one of which was a kind of plutocratic billionaire who embraced the 1%, and the other is a kind of neo-populist, um, self-proclaimed progressive Democrat who has done certain things that are dramatically different than his predecessor, especially around the minimum wage, around universal free K. But when it comes to planning, development, and housing, their agendas are a lot closer than they are different. 
and we end up with a paradigm where whatever problems the city is facing, the solution includes luxury development. After that, I look at the Trump family, uh, three generations of the Trump family as examples of um, the way that developers have kind of changed their business model to match what the state was up to. Um, this is, of course, Donald Trump's, Trump's MO uh, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and right up to the present, um, especially kind of taking advantage of neoliberalism, of the state's interest in incentivizing luxury development through rezonings, through privatizations of public land, through tax breaks, et cetera. Um, at one point, selling uh, subprime loans at the same time he was selling uh, a university program, so-called, on how to make money off of other people's foreclosures. So he's kind of a paradigmatic example, but his father embraced what was going on with urban planning uh, from the 30s through the 60s, which is a very different model, but he still found a way to make a lot of money and did so in a really racist way uh, that once the Fair Housing Act came into effect through their business model uh, into question. And before him, Trump's father's father's father was also doing uh, real estate deals based off of um, the state's interest in westward expansion um, and all the genocidal implications thereof. And then once he moved to New York, taking advantage of where the subway lines were gonna go, buying up property that was not worth a lot of money that was then suddenly worth a whole lot more once this public infrastructure was put into place. So once again, making private profit off of public investment. So then finally, in the uh, fifth chapter, I get into what we could do about this. Uh, I don't just want to paint a picture of how bad things are, though I do think it's important to understand how bad things are, how they got to be that way. Um, and the way that that chapter is structured is in thirds. And the first third looks at all the things we could be doing right now that for the most part we're not doing. And that maybe some cities are doing in pieces, but no city in this country is like uh, really taking this seriously and doing it all together. And this has to do with rent control, reinvesting in our existing public housing. Um, it has to do with using the tax code to go after speculators and people who are warehousing property rather than rewarding that kind of behavior. It has to do with creating community land trusts, which already exist in certain areas and could be dramatically expanded. All these things are totally kosher, right? You can do them in a capitalist system, you can do them in the form of government that we have right now, and yet it's not where we're going for all the reasons that I laid out in the prior four chapters. But it's important to say we could be doing something else and not to sort of use our structural analysis of capitalism to let off the hook all our politicians who are really embracing this mode of development. So then after that, I think about um, this book is put out by a socialist press and a socialist magazine, so throwing that out there. I think about what a, a socialist agenda um, for urban planning might look like. And I talk about, you know, what would land be if it wasn't a commodity? What would we be able to do in a context where land couldn't be bought and sold like any other commodity? Um, what could we do if we plan beyond the existing borders so that every city wasn't making its own contradictory plan to the city right next to it, uh, let alone from country to country? And I talk about um, actually making the people who build out the city through their physical labor, through their cultural work, through the neighborhood institutions, having the power to have a say over our planning system. Because right now, um, American urban planning was really developed to mediate between the competing interest of landowners. And Kingston, as I understand, is 54% renters. So that, that makes the majority of the people here in Africa. So really thinking about what a um, people, people first planning system might look like. And then finally, I think about what kind of politics do we need to develop to do any of this? To do the stuff that's kosher right now and to move beyond the system as it exists. And there's a lot of kind of um, movements discussed in there and ideas for what planners can do and for uh, what uh, politicians can do. But really, I think it comes down to tenant movements. And this is where it comes full circle. It is because way too much capital has been invested into urban real estate at way too high debt levels that tenants actually have a kind of interesting structural power. The whole premise is they can get us to uh, leave our homes or pay more. And if we can force a wrench into that order, 
the whole system comes into question, if not chaos, if not crisis, right? If we can organize the power to resist evictions, if we can get the, the laws on our side to stabilize rents and make it so that that investor who bought out the building with the intention of clearing it out and tripling the rents just can't do that, that would be a problem for the capitalist class. And so the power then is actually with tenants, but not as individuals. Uh, New York City is a super majority tenant. And this past year, the New York State rent laws were significantly improved, but that was after years and years and years of them getting worse and worse and worse. So it's not numbers alone that give us this power. It's only when we organize and activate uh, in a really um, confrontational way. And so that's, that's what I talk about in the final chapter. Um, and so to conclude this portion where I'm reading, I'll, I'll read a little bit of the conclusion and then we'll move on to Q&A. Cities seem to be headed in two different directions at once. Some places are bursting with capital, largely channeled through land and property investment. These hyper-invested cities are becoming more expensive and attracting higher income dwellers, even as they continue to depend on low-wage workers. Displacement is becoming a regular occurrence and a constant fear for working class residents. Other places are facing disinvestment, with employment declining, housing falling into dangerous disrepair, and vulture capitalists stalking the streets in search of assets to strip. Their city leaders are scrambling for cash and trying anything to get investors' attention, including selling off public lands, slashing taxes, and investing in creative city features. Here, the trend has shifted from smokestack chasing to skyscraper chasing. Two races to the bottom, in which cities and states compete for, low, for capital investment by offering low taxes, lax regulation, and disciplined labor. Um, I wrote that before the Amazon announcements were made. <laughs> Hyperinvestment and extreme disinvestment seem like separate, parallel, one-way streets that cities can travel down toward opposite futures. These contrasting tendencies, however, are closer than they appear. First, hyper-invested and deeply disinvested cities are not necessarily separate places. Often they coexist within the same municipality and even on the same block. Cities like Newark and Chicago are simultaneously expanding and collapsing in value. Even in extreme examples, the opposite is always present. Los Angeles is home to some of the world's wealthiest individuals, as well as tens of thousands of people who live on the streets and in shelters. Some paint Baltimore as emblematic of urban crisis, but there too exist pockets of great wealth. Urban inequality is not so much a question of rich cities and poor cities, as the simultaneous and dependent relationship of wealth and poverty. Second, these two urban futures tilt toward each other. One person's disinvestment is another's deal, as abandoned properties and vacant lots are purchased on the cheap, reinvested, redeveloped, and resold for enormous profits. At the same time, overinvested places are vulnerable to surplus crises. Too much investment in properties no one will buy or rent and when the bubble bursts, the rent and sale prices fall. Each process can be a precondition for the other. Finally, these urban divergences are expressions of the same phenomenon, a political economy organized around real estate. When space becomes the primary commodity and rents overdetermine all other economic activity, cities become vulnerable to extremes of wealth and poverty, glitz and grit. Everyone plays their part. Financiers make derivatives that spin housing into abstractions. Architects make boxes for high-end investment. Politicians make promises to build, build, build. And planners bend space toward profit. These characteristics of the real estate state are easiest to spot in expensive cities like New York, where landlords and developers effectively control the political machine and planning apparatus. But they are just as present in cheaper cities, like Las Vegas, where subprime mortgages burn through the landscape like wildfire. Geographer Patrick Vitale argues that Pittsburgh and Detroit, two Rust Belt cities frequently portrayed respectively as models of post-industrial success and failure, are actually experiencing inverse versions of the same phenomenon. Quote, the Pittsburgh region can be likened to Detroit, the most cited example of urban decline, but turned inside out. In Michigan, capital fled to the suburbs leaving behind a crumbling city center. 
In Pennsylvania, deindustrialization decimated Pittsburgh suburbs, while some part of the city enjoyed relatively stable investment. Whether the money is going into or out of cities, capital's relation to land is the guiding force in these regions' trajectories. All of these places link their destinies to rising property values and set their planners to work finding clever ways to accomplish that goal above all others. Even when well-intentioned planners are not thinking about, about property values and instead aim to make space more beautiful and friendly for working class residents, their efforts are usurped by landowners who then raise the cost of living for the very people planners intended to serve. When this planning model works, the result is gentrification. Investors sweep in, property values rise, and the people who suffer the most from disinvestment are swept away by, the real, by real estate's rising tide. The initial capital for reinvestment often comes directly out of other spaces, contributing to somewhere else's disinvestment and sending their planners on a mission to retrieve lost revenues. Where gentrification takes hold, the city turns to neoliberal boosterism and treats public space as a private investment opportunity. Where gentrification fails, the city turns to neoliberal austerity and slashes the budgets for everything but the police. Because gentrification and disinvestment offer, often occur simultaneously in the same cities, most government and planning departments operate with a combination of both approaches. I then conclude by saying, let's not give up on planning. Planning is a big part of the solution, not only Thank you so much for listening and for coming, and I look forward to your questions. Hi, in our uh, city of Kingston, we have politicians who are very, very concerned about the lack of affordable housing, and there is much public hand wringing on the part of these politicians. However, it's really all smoke and mirrors because these same politicians are pushing through a $52 million project of which $7 million comes from state funds, uh, grants from state funds, and in which, as you talked about, the taking of uh, private, public property for private use, in fact, a public property will be taken for private use. Uh, in addition, this particular project happens to take place in an opportunity zone, uh, which means that people can invest in the qualified opportunity funds and their identity will never be known because there are no disclosure regulations, which means, of course, that politicians themselves can invest in these, in these qualified opportunity funds, thereby skirting the laws that prevent politicians from investing in projects in which they have a say. Um, what would you say that we can do to prevent this project, which is also built entirely on lies. There are promises of parking that if you do the math, they do not exist. It is not a green, it is not a green uh, project at all. Basically, it's just another, another instance of shoveling pub tax dollars and public dollars towards more private, private concerns, money-making concerns. What can we do? Okay, thank you for, for that, and thank you for the local context, because you, everyone in the room knows more about what's happening in Kingston than I do, so let's, let's make that clear. Um, I have a lot of questions about the specifics, uh, so, so I can't necessarily answer, but like, first of all, is there a rezoning that's involved? Does the city take any oh, yes, public action? Of course there's a rezoning. Have they already done it? Uh, it's in the process of being done, and fortunately, the, the county planning board, which is a little more civilized mm -hmm. than the city planning board, uh, has asked for an explanation of why there's no affordable housing because in our city, the comprehensive plan, which supersedes code, mm -hmm. calls for affordable housing. It's nice that you have a comprehensive plan. New York City has no comprehensive plan and has never had one. So we go rezoning by rezoning without any kind of higher uh, map to look to. So that's a, a strong tool. Um, so getting involved in the planning process, but not in such a way that you're just getting sort of being co-opted and giving a public cover to the project. But if you actually don't want the project, then demanding that it be stopped through the public process. Um, if you want something out of it, then you can demand that something be negotiated. But if you want it stopped, the demand has to be that it be stopped. Um, next, I mean, it, I would ask, have the capital grants already been given out, or is it something that they're applying for? And if it's something that they're applying for? No, they for, come through the, the downtown revitalization initiative. They're getting $3.8 million from this DRI grant. And also in Plattsburgh, Oneonta, Watertown, mm -hmm. Glens Falls, there have been the same problem with private developers coming in and ramming through a project 
that the citizen that it does not really suit the citizens. So I mean, we need a better planning process, right? Obviously, the planning process is not working, uh, or at least not working for the people of these cities if, if what's being built up is not what they would demand. So um, ways to achieve that. I mean, ultimately, you're going to have to either strike fear into the politicians who appoint all these people, or you're going to have to replace them. Um, an organized tenant movement, I think, is the, probably the strongest way to strike that kind of fear into these politicians. Uh, so well on your way to that. Um, but really, they have to fear that if they go ahead with this business as usual, they will have no job. That's probably the, the highest leverage that um, people have in these situations. Um, and being out in front that this is not something that you want and this is not something that you'll stand for is, is the best way to go. It has to be a confrontational process rather than a collaborative process, right? You'll always hear, and this is how planning education is generally presented, um, let's just get all the stakeholders together and we will find a compromise that works for everyone. That, let's, let's sort of transplant that to the world of work. That only works when you have unions, right? When you have a, a organized voice standing up on behalf of workers who can negotiate a collective bargaining agreement with their employer mediated by the state. That's something very different than a kind of anything goes planning process where every individual has a say, but really the power is with the money. So um, these kind of open processes with no accountability tend to grant public legitimacy to projects you would otherwise oppose. So you have to find ways to make them into confrontations instead. So in Queens, New York, near where I live, there's a plan to um, pave over a giant public rail yard and build up basically like a new city on top of it. It would be three times larger than the Hudson Yards project, which was the biggest private real estate development in the country's history. So turning those processes, or, or maybe like turning, showing the lie of those processes, that they're not actually these public engagement processes, but they're actually um, mandated and highly co-optable um, stage pieces, I think is a, is a very effective way to throw a wrench into these programs. Well, we, there's one other detail. Okay. Unfortunately, there are two mayoral possible. candidates, so the two, the two main mayoral They both support it? Unfortunately, they both support it. And uh, there have been purges in the in the uh, certain commissions to get rid of people who supported a further secret determination. So I really hope that all the real Kingstonians here will organize under the under the aegis of certain of the tenants associations. People can also say questions out loud, and I can repeat them back. Into the Thank you very much. Getting the mic around this yeah. One second. Oh, so I'm just going to call it you. Yes. You. Okay. Are you, yeah, are, you. are people comfortable speaking without passing the mic around and you can hang on to yours and we can hang on to yours? Are you comfortable with that? Sure. If, I, if people want the mic, just say I want the mic. I just wanted to say before we move on, I wanted to ask, uh, because I'm sorry, what's your name? Just first name? Good question. Just your first name. I know okay. this person, the person who just, sorry, it's not uh, important. Yeah, my name is Laura Ross and you can read all about the Kingstonian at hbvindy.com. Okay. All right, thank you, Ilona. I, as, as Ilona just said, I brought up public officials, so I just wanted to tie this in quickly. One of the things that we hear from officials when um, we bring up affordable housing is that there needs to be development for all income levels. Um, and I know that you had something to say about that in, in your book, so I wanted to give you an opportunity to do that. Sure, I mean, this is kind of like the all lives matter of the housing world. <laughs> we, we don't live in a situation where we need all levels of income housing. The developers are already building for the top of the market and they always will, unless all sorts of land use policies, be they taxation, zoning, regulation, make it so that that's not profitable anymore and it actually makes sense to build something else. We need a bottom-up rather than a top-down approach. Build up the social housing that cities actually need to uh, house workers in good conditions at moderate rates. And then if you want to build something else for somebody else, go ahead. But we need to make sure that uh, the base is covered rather than this sort of trickle-down model where we build a bunch of luxury development and then we assume that somehow that benefits everybody. Which again, is like if we pay the boss a whole lot of money, it'll benefit all of the workers. And that, it just doesn't work. Like, 
the, the, the values of uh, capitalist development are, are actually quite similar to the values of a capitalist firm, and we would never let that stand in, uh, in a business operation, or at least we wouldn't consider it in the worker's best interest. Thank you. So I'm a lifer here. I've, I, I've seen this community go up and down a few times. But for many, many years, we were an investment scarce community, and now we are, now is the bounce back. And there's some great benefits to it, and there's some great problems. And I think planners and you know are caught in this spin. And um, this this has all happened in really 10 years. I mean, this this uptown area. I moved up here with a business in 2004, and it was empty. I mean, I would say 50, 60 percent of the storefronts were empty. There was very little residential up uh, in the in the top four apartments that were around, partly because of prior zoning that said that they wanted residential separate from commercial, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of story, but the, the, the question is, how do you, I mean, this is, this is like, a, you know, it's just happening so quickly. Yeah. And, and to your point, I mean, you sort of described the trickle down thing doesn't necessarily work, but I have to tell you, uh, I'm a renter right now. Now I've owned homes and I could, could go buy a home if I need to, and I will at some point, but there is a big middle of the road problem too. It's really right. hard to find, a, you know, a home for somebody that makes a reasonable income without being wealthy. Um, so we're stuck in this whole spiral at the moment. And I think what we're all looking for is some answers on how we all can find a, you know. Yeah, and so if anyone couldn't hear uh, the question, just to, to summarize, uh, the, what's your name? Lee. Lee was making the point that Right now, this is a heavily capital, capitally intensive city. There's a lot of investment. Uh, not that long ago, it was capital scarce. There was not a lot of investment. Businesses were not doing so well. Um, and so the city is kind of caught in this whiplash. Um, and, and which, just to say, I mean, that, that spiral was 30 to 40 years in the making. Yeah, and they usually are about that period. That's, that's actually pretty normal in terms of uh, capital flows. It's the same as a mortgage, 30 years. <laughs> So, um, there are problems on both sides, right? Nobody is happy with either situation. You don't want to be in a, in a city that is uh, totally devoid of investment, where there's no jobs, even if the housing is cheap. Even there, in cities like that, there's a huge eviction crisis. Evictions are even worse in places that are investment scarce than in places that are gentrified. But it's bad on both ends. Um, and some people who are kind of like... Um, Skeptics of people like me will say gentrification uh, doesn't cause displacement. Poor people just have a hard time living places. So in yeah. like disinvested cities, there's a lot of displacement also, and that's totally true. And the the point that we can take from that is capitalism is really bad at housing for people without a lot of money. On both ends of that spectrum, it's a really hard situation, and so that's why we we can't just build like. We can't be seesawing back and forth all the time. Um, this is not sustainable. It's not good for most people um, to be on either end of that situation. As you said, there gets to be a hollowing out. So some people have some kind of protection and can stay, even though they don't have a lot of money. Uh, a bunch more people can stay because they have a lot of money and they buy in. And then in the middle, it gets really hard. So none of these are, are good situations, and that's why um, as I was saying at the very end, I really do believe in planning that we can try to supersede some of these market forces which just create chaos over and over again. And we're gonna have to take control of the market um, rather than sort of let the market sort itself out. Because if we let the market sort itself out, we're going to be uh, in those just fluctuations back and forth all the time, hoping for a happy medium that we rarely my question is, are there examples of cities that we can point our planners to? Are there planning and, and codes that we can offer as ideas? Right. So I would say that there are a lot of different things happening in a lot of different places that can be combined. But there's no place that I look at and I say, yes, that's right. Not in the US anyway. I was going to say Havana, right? Havana's cool. <laughs> want to go in that direction? I mean, Berlin right now, where they're talking about buying back um, how many units? Does anybody know of him? Huge, huge numbers of units that have been privatized are going to go back into the public system. Vienna is the model um, that all American socialists love, where 30% is public, 30% is cooperative uh, with income restrictions, and 30% is private market rate housing. 
Um, there's, there's models all over the world. In the US, there's a lot of things. Like, first of all, and I understand this is happening, Kingston needs to get into ETPA, uh, New York State's Rent Stabilization Program. That would be very important. Then we need to expand rent stabilization to cover more kinds of housing stock, because also, as I understand it, five out of six Kingston tenants would not be covered by the expansion that's now legal. So that has to be a top priority. It is a top priority for the housing movement statewide. But places like Kingston, like Troy, where I did a talk, can really be um, like the, the cover story of why we need that expansion, because the model that we have is not enough. Um, I really like the model in Washington, DC. They have two programs. One is called TOPA, and the other is called DOPA. <laughs> TOPA stands for Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act. DOPA stands for District, as in City, Opportunity to Purchase Act. When an apartment building goes on sale in that city, the tenants have the, fight, have the right of first refusal. They have the right to buy it. And if they buy it and turn it into permanently affordable cooperatives, the city will give them significant tax advantage. That model was really good at providing uh, permanently affordable housing in the down market. Right now it's hard because tenants can't raise the capital because the market is up. But it's a good thing to have in place if, if the market swings back into that down market you can protect a whole lot of people forever. There are, there are 99 year renewable programs. Um, and then there are more examples discussed in the book of these things that are happening throughout the cities. We need to combine them rather than have this piecemeal approach where each city has one interesting thing. Burlington, Vermont has more community land trust per capita than any other area. That's a great model to look at and expand this one. There was a, yeah. Hi, my name is Henry. So first off, I really appreciate the analyst analysis you've done with your book. And I guess maybe first things first, um, where do I get a copy tonight? Because I want to get it autographed and all that. I'll pay for it right now. How much is it? Um, it's usually $17. I think it's 10% off, so probably uh, 15%. Okay, so I'll do the transaction after this. Um, <laughs> what else is interesting to me is, as a community organizer, um, like for example, I've spent a bit of time, I raised a family in California moved out to Jersey because I wanted to work in the city. But then what happened for me is that I just really got disenchanted giving my skills and my best to banks, to brokerages, solving the most complex problems for them and realizing that communities have desperate needs. So in thinking about what you shared in your book, it seems like when you get to chapter five, it starts talking about solutions. The early chapters seem to talk about describing the problem, yep. which is really helpful. But it, it seems to me that, that so often we as individuals take this as a form of entertainment, mm -hmm. right? So we pride ourselves in hearing the facts and this and that, but then what do we do personally, right? Because we're like waiting for somebody else to do something. And for me, I find it really frustrating because people seem like they don't want to take any risk, any personal risk, to try to be part of what's necessary. And we're literally at a point where we're gonna wait for the younger people to run us over because we don't have the passion for doing what needs to be done. So I would like to ask if you could maybe share a couple of best practices that you have seen successful in other cities. You were, we were talking about it. And if you could maybe elaborate on that. Like for example, you mentioned uh, land trusts yes. and where you see maybe as a next step for Kingston to take this further. Okay, great. Has a, a land trust? Okay. We don't, we don't. Yes. We have a, a, a land trust Right. And, and I think there's a lot of cities that are in that situation. So first of all, I really appreciate what you said about this is not just entertainment, right? I don't want people to go home tonight and think, wow, the world sucks and that, that's it. Um, and the other thing I want to say is, uh, yes, my book is four chapters of how things are and why they are that way. And then one chapter about what we might do about it. There's another book called What a City is For by a guy named Matt Hearn out of Vancouver. That's the exact inverse. He wrote one chapter about how bad things are and then four others about what we might do about it. So I think they, they pair well together. Uh, maybe the bookstore can order some. Um, so then in terms of, of some takeaways and best practices. So yeah, let's start with community land trust. And what's great is it sounds like there is an infrastructure to expand. So a community land trust, um, I bet somebody, possibly you, knows more about this than I do, um, but it's a form of permanently affordable cooperative land ownership. Um, that's premised on the idea that you have two entities owning uh, land and buildings. One that owns the land 
and it's kept in a trust and nothing can be done with it, and then others that own the building. And it might be a mutual housing authority of all the tenants that live there, or it might be a nonprofit organization that owns the buildings, and some of them are home ownership models. In Minneapolis, they have a lot of home ownership community land trusts. You own your home, but you don't own the land. And so if the value of the land goes up, the people living on top of it don't see their property values change because they don't own that land. And vice versa, if suddenly the kind of architecture you have in the city, which walking around is gorgeous, it becomes highly valued, the price of the land uh, doesn't go up as a result of that. It's not owned by the same entities. And so that kind of like one little trick goes a long way in creating permanent affordability if the covenants are written such that um, you can't sell it for more money and they're targeted toward the kind of income levels you have in the city or uh, the people who most need housing. So you have something that does community land trust for, uh, for conservation. A lot of cities have that. Maybe it's time to move into it uh, with land. And there are cities that have land banks, like Newburgh has a land bank. So when uh, property is abandoned and the city takes it over, it goes into this land bank. But then it tends to go out to people who want to do private for-profit development, and it becomes a speculative venture that's just sort of city managed. That's not any good. If you have a land bank, land bank, it should be transferring the properties into the community land trust. Because the hardest thing about a community land trust is getting land, especially in cities that are already expensive, which Kingston now is. So uh, using the city as a way to facilitate the expansion of, of the community land trust is really important. I also think strong rent controls are important for reasons that aren't always discussed. Rent control is great because it controls rents. We know that. Um, it's also great because it takes away the landlord's ability to raise your rent because of things that are going on in the neighborhood. Right? So I was talking before um, with some of the organizers of the event about how there's this arts festival in Kingston that a lot of people love, but we're also aware that it raises the property values and that's even part of the marketing of the arts event. Couldn't we have the arts event and even if the property values go up, they can't raise your rent? The answer is yes, and it's rent control, and we already do it in New York State. We just don't cover most of the most vulnerable people. So we can have, if we have a real rent control system, people could be you know, pushing for public art all over the place because everyone loves public art. We only don't like public art because it tends to raise the property values, which then translates into a rising rent, which means I can't enjoy the art anymore. The same thing goes for transportation, right? We want mass transit, but once they put a subway line or a streetcar down your street, the property value is going to go up insanely, and if it can be translated into a rising rent, it will, and then you won't get to ride that streetcar. Um, so, green improvements, right? We want our cities to be more sustainable. We're all going to die in a, a sea level rise catastrophe if nothing changes. And yet, nobody wants to make the improvement necessary because it'll raise the property value and then raise the rent, and then we won't be able to live there. So, rent control is a simple thing, it's not a solution everything but it's a way of slowing down or decoupling all the public investment we want from our ability to be in place so there's two things that are in that uh, vein of kosher in the system right now um, that we can all look at and then you know organize towards things that are so-called trade in the in the system right now that are, that are not kosher uh, that are beyond what what our uh, our constitution and our capitalist system Of property. How do you cap that? I'm sure that a lot of people who live in Kingston 
person who don't even want their property to go up that mountain. Because once it does, it turns into a different place. And there's, as we know, billions and billions of dollars 90 miles to the south that could come here at any time if they need to make water quality. It's not happening. And it is. But is there any way in the American system to prevent everybody with property from rising without sabotaging the city? That's a lot harder. <laughs> um, so, solve capitalism solve for us, Sam. Do it right now. You got it. Uh, anybody have a cap? Yeah. Um, the, the first thing to address is that rising property values are not always good for homeowners. So the assumption is always that homeowners want their property values to go up and up and up, which a lot of them do if they intend to sell or if they have enough money to pay the taxes once the property valuation goes up, the assessment. There's a lot of people who get displaced from their homes because they just can't afford uh, the assessed value anymore, the taxes on the assessed value. I was in Stanford, Connecticut on Thursday, and that city has similar numbers to Kingston in terms of how much uh, tenants pay out in rent. But interestingly, a third of homeowners are paying more than a third of their income toward uh, property taxes, and there's like 18% that are paying more than 50%. So that 18% is in real uh, trouble. If they don't pay those taxes, they could end up in tax foreclosure and it could be real trouble. So uh, there are homeowners who are kind of on that page. How you do it, it's hard. So it's hard for a lot of reasons. And one is that most cities have no interest in doing it because a lot of where the revenue comes from is property taxes. And so the, the incentive is, is for it to go up so that we have more money to do even the things we want to do, like develop affordable housing. That's so it's great, but like, you know, when, when somebody, I have a friend who went to CrossFit, you know? CrossFit? He worked out his body. Uh -huh. Got really, really nice. Really big, gigantic. He could pick up anybody he wanted because he's a shirt right now. But it's okay for to be just an attractive, normal shaped person. Right. So <laughs> at what point do people just say, I don't want to grow? I don't okay. want suburbs. I don't want eight story condos. How do you make it happen? This place is, is really great and special. And, and if, if it's doing well, uh -huh. that's a problem. Yeah, yeah, right. And, and this is kind of like the, the flip side of the problem that we discussed before. Um, I mean, you can, you can make it, you can use taxation in a way that makes it not valuable to uh, build up large expensive properties, right? If you, if you have like a huge mansion tax, which doesn't just mean a tax on large properties, it means a tax on very expensive properties. Um, there's less of a chance that developers will be building them for, for the purposes of hiding money because you're gonna be paying taxes on it all the time. Um, you can have vacancy taxes for the same reason to keep people from buying, from developing property for the purpose of selling it to someone who has no intention of living there. Um, we tried both those things in the last legislative session. We got a modest increase on taxes on the sale of high value property. We did not get the vacancy tax. Um, you can use zoning changes to that to some extent, but you really, we don't, really don't wanna be in a situation where we just lock in what we have. Um, because what we have was created under a system that we had no control over and wasn't that great to begin with. We love our communities. We wanna have a say over what changes in them and how. And that means democratizing planning rather than freezing things as they are um, within the system. There's basically no easy answer for the question. Uh, one of the themes throughout the book is what happened after industry left places? And this is, Kingston is, is a case study in that. Um, and a lot of it we know, right? The jobs went away um, and the property value went down and then they went up again. And the way I've described it in the book is real estate and the finance industry kind of filling the vacuum that industry used to play. And part of the role of industry in older models of capitalism was as a check against real estate capital's interests. So industry wanted low cost housing because they didn't want to have to pay their workers that much. And they knew if the cost of housing was skyrocketing, the workers would be at their door demanding higher wages. So there was actually an arm of capital that was interested in affordable housing and low land prices. They are gone from Kingston, they are largely gone from New York City. So another thing we can do is re-diversify our economies. And once again, this is the in, the in the part of the section that's about what you can do in capitalism. It's, it's a very kind of like Rube Goldberg system, but if we created a more diversified economy with a set of interests that uh, were aligned with lower cost land and housing, that might help um, tamper the ever upward drive of property values.
We've got you and then Juanita. Hi. Um, I have just two questions. One, you know what you have to say about this tsunami of short-term rentals that it's taking Like Airbnb? Yeah. yeah. And then my other question is, I, I gather you get subtle about it, but you're not the biggest fan of fire. Um, <laughs> what? Some of my best friends are fire. <laughs> but here in the city of Kingston, as far as I'm aware, we have no trained fires in the fire department. And just what do you think that, what do you have to say about that? Um, okay, so yeah, I'll repeat the questions. The first one was um, the boom in short-term rentals, things like Airbnb. And the second question was, um, it seems like the planning department is not staffed by trained planners. What do I think about that? So on the first question, um, yeah, Airbnb is totally transforming property relations in a lot of places. It turns um, tenants into small landlords. It creates incentives for landlords not to rent to permanent tenants and then shrinks the available housing stock. So even if we believe in kind of a neoclassical model of supply and demand, it's bad. Uh, because it reduces the amount of available um, long-term rentals for tenants. A lot of what Airbnb does is illegal. It's illegal in um, municipalities and states, and they get away with it, and they basically say um, to their the, their users, the, the people who are using Airbnb to fill property, look at your local law and try not to break it. And then they hope that people do it anyway. It's exactly the same as Uber and Lyft and other rideshare com uh, companies that routinely break the law and in the hope that they won't be caught or that the law will then change to enable what uh, was formerly illegal. I think Airbnb is a similar model. So cracking down on enforcement is really important. Um, also breaking down the ideology that Airbnb is the savior of high rents. They want to um, portray their system as something that will help tenants uh, or struggling homeowners stay in unaffordable communities. But at the same time, it's their very business model that accelerates uh, the housing prices going up and the quantity of available affordable rental housing going down. So we can't have the poison be the cure. It's not uh, a vaccine or something like that. The second question um, was about the dearth of trained planners. I can't speak to the situation in Kingston, um, I will say that the City Planning Commission of New York is not mostly trained planners, and every single one of them has a background in real estate. 100%. Even the one that I like. <laughs> there's, there's one that I like, and she's a nonprofit developer, but she's still a developer. That's how she got onto the board, is because she's a developer. So we have had a real estate capture of our planning apparatus, um, and it's important to take it back. Part of the problem is as real estate grows, those real estate firms are hiring away planning graduates who might otherwise work in, in city agencies. Um, and so it's tough, but you know, I'm speaking at planning schools as much as I can. There's reading groups in planning schools about my book. And I hope, like people have come to me and said, I read your book and now I'm not so sure I wanna be a planner. And I say to them, no, 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 please, if you wanted to do this, do it and try to make change um, it, we need allies on that side as well. You know, you're not going to be the savior and the solution, but if you don't do it, some real estate schmuck is, and that's not going to be good for us. Um, let me check the time. What's the other time? Uh, 620, so okay, we can... I'm going to say, oh, we've got a question. What, Mike? Yeah. 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 Anybody else had a question? Uh, okay, one, two. Okay. One, Mike or yeah. not? Mike, oh. Yeah, I, wanted, I was wondering if you'd speak to the connection of the... Can you use the mic, please? Please use the mic. Yes, please. <laughs> I was wondering if you could speak to the connection between the freelance, temporary, contingent labor market where, according to the National Economies Law Project, the... <laughs> Sorry, the National Employment Law Project, 43% of workers now are contingent workers of one form or the other. And the short-term housing situation with Airbnb. I mean, I've, I've also seen people living two hours away and then having Airbnbs and telecommuting and a co whole combination of factors, which is making it hard to control people's time and schedules. And Yeah, I mean, these two things are definitely linked. Um, I wrote an article about this years ago that was 
talking about precarity, labor precarity, and gentrification as a feedback loop, um, each making the other worse and amplifying the, the, uh, the problem, in part because people are constantly moving when they don't have stable employment. And when people are constantly moving, that creates all sorts of opportunities for landlords. Specifically in New York, it used to be until recently in the rent stabilized properties, the landlord could raise the rent 20% every time somebody moved out without doing any kind of investment in the property. And so I, I do think those two things go together. And some of it is the, the online platforms. You know, it's the gig economy that's controlled by TaskRabbit or whatever that's also giving us Airbnb. And again, trying to sell it as the solution that you can use Airbnb as a form of revenue because your job isn't paying you enough. Um, so one way to look at this whole issue is just that wages aren't high enough. You know, forget housing costs. Wages aren't high enough. If the wages were higher, then we could afford higher rents and it wouldn't be a problem. I think that's true, but um, the, the housing costs are escalating um, very, very, very fast. So we don't want a situation where our wages go up and our housing costs goes up at the same time. And basically, once again, the landlord just takes something out from the boss. And it's the boss paying the landlord, and, and we don't get to keep it. So we need to deal with both of those things at the same time. My book focuses more on the um, on the, the housing side, but my dissertation is going to have a lot more on, on the job side. So look out for the next book. <laughs> just a question. I don't know if this is something you would address, but about commercial. Because we have, from time to time, you know, we rent commercial space and lo and behold we realize that there are no limitations on commercial rentals yeah. and I think that feels very much a crunch to us as well. So the question was about um, commercial rents which have also uh, been going up and up and up and at least in New York State we have the ETPA, the Emergency Tenant Protection Act which is rent stabilization which is not enough for anybody but certainly not for Kingston but is a step forward. We don't have anything like that for commercial. We have had commercial rent control in the past. So that's not um, a thing we would have to imagine, but it is a thing we'd have to bring back if we wanted to do it. Um, in New York City, there is a push for something called the Small Business Jobs Protection Act, which would kind of impose um, a mediation, like a, an external mediator on uh, commercial landlords and tenants to try to prevent the rents from just going up. Because what we see is, at first, there's a high turnover. And um, the, the cheap stores become kind of funky stores, and then the funky stores become fancy stores. And then they go out of business. That's the weird thing. It's like eventually, they're vacant. Because the commercial property itself is very valuable and can be sold at a higher rate. And banks tend to give favorable mortgage terms to uh, landowners or property owners who put in big chain stores who they consider very reliable rent payers as opposed to small businesses, even fancy small businesses. And so we have to deal with the, with the lending conditions. Um, we have to deal with the, the radically unequal power dynamic between the commercial landlord and the commercial tenant. Um, and we can think about whether rent control is something we want. I mean, the, I, I would say the biggest downside to that is there are landlords who rent out the commercial space for a lot of money and then rent out the residential space for less and basically use the commercial to subsidize the residential. Those are very rare, however, and they only ever come out when this question is raised. But in certain neighborhoods, like in Chinatown in New York City, um, that is a fairly common phenomenon. So that's, that's the only, like, maybe question to think about if that's the case here. Got one more, one, what, hey, this, this man, the gentleman in the back, and then this person will be our last question. No, did you hear your hand up? Yes. Yeah. Um, you and then you, and then that's it. We'll take them both together, and then I'll answer them. Yes. Yeah. And your question then I'll answer. Please. Yeah, uh, my question is on uh, when you spoke earlier about leasing the land and on property. I, I heard there's been issues with people getting mortgages when there's only a certain amount of years left, like under 30 years. And then what happens when the lease runs out is mm -hmm. then there's no um, the issue that occur. After that. Okay. Uh, so to repeat the questions for those who couldn't hear, the first question was about the phenomenon known as urban homesteading. The second question was about, even if you have a long-term lease, what happens when the lease is up for renewal and often there's displacement at that point? Is that and getting mortgages on your, if there's like only 20 years left on the lease, getting mortgages for your, your uh, house or, or condo also, I heard the issues with that. 
Um, so let me start with the second and then get to first. I think, I could be wrong, but I think you're, you're saying that in reaction to when I said that even a community land trust is a 99 year lease? Yeah. Or yeah, was it? Lease, so like the land lease. Oh, interesting. Uh, where there's a land lease and, and the, the lease is running out like 20 years, you can't get a mortgage for more than 50 years. You're not getting a loan from the bank. I'm going to limit myself and say that I am I'm not totally sure. So I'm gonna I'm gonna dodge the question. I apologize. Question about urban homesteading. I mean, basically that means uh, people taking over vacant properties. And um, th through, sweat through, through sweat equity, which means like you do the work to make the place habitable, um, and then you try to hold on to it. And there's a lot of different models that have been used for this. Um, and it's, it's a very important thing in times when there's a large amount of property abandonment. I don't know that that's the case in Kingston right now, given how much investment there is, but it probably was the case 10 years ago, and it might be the case again, and it's certainly the case in surrounding cities. Um, New York City had a lot of property abandonment in the mid-1970s and 80s, and there was a whole movement to take over those properties. Either the existing tenants would take them over, or uh, people would move into them and fix them up and try to keep them. And some of them were turned into limited equity cooperatives. So the, uh, the takeover people, basically the former tenants or squatters, came to be the owners of it in such a way that they could never sell it for anything more than what they bought it for, which was essentially nothing. So it becomes this kind of permanent affordable housing that the, the people who did the work to make it habitable have got, and the landlord has lost their right to the property. There's others who have used something called adverse possession, which I know less about, but which is a legal uh, process by which people say, look, the landlord walked away and we're the only reason this building is standing, it's ours now. And people have had some success with that. Um, it's, it's in some ways relying on a property rights framework because you're saying that we are the true property uh, protectors and therefore we will now take possession of this building. But it's written into the constitution as something, or the, I think, I don't know, it's written into some law, common law. Uh, that, that we can do this. Um, there's a group in New York City called UHAB, uh, Urban, Homestead, or Urban Homestead Assistance Board, which exists solely for the purpose of helping people do this work, and at this point, helping people stay in those homes. Um, so the model exists, it can be expanded, it's hard to do in a place where investors all, are all over uh, the, the built environment, but it's very important in places where, they're, where the, the landlords are walking away from their buildings. Um, and it's also very important not to just fix up the buildings and then, you know, once it's nice again, the landlord returns. Because that's what they're going to want to do, right? Take advantage of all the work that the, that the residents did. Um, we need legal mechanisms to, to take permanent possession of these places if they were abandoned by their <laughs> landlord. And, uh, People in them kept them going. Okay, we've got one more question. Yeah, a question and a statement from the cool. from either the Kate, you person and then then the Kieran Selsky. Yes. How's it going? Thanks for this. I'll try to make this quick. Um, you spoke earlier about how even uh, with wage increase, even um, on a local scale, it does not change the fact that with increasingly rising rates of the prices of homes and renting in an area, no problem is gonna be solved, just by giving people a few more bucks. So realistically, on a local scale, how do you think that we can influence the change in that, kind of elaborate on that discussion? How can we maybe put a halt, even aside from, you know, with rent stability, how can we do it on a local level and not have to rely on state level? It's really hard, um, like the scale of question, right? We want to do things local, but sometimes we have to appeal to a higher scale of government. And so I think there are things that we can do locally. Um, and then there are other things that actually we're not allowed to do locally because of the way that uh, things shook out, mostly in the 1970s, states have preemption um, that prevents cities from doing some of the cool things that we might want to do. So sometimes we have to go to the state level 
to do things like expanding rent control. We can't do that at the local level because there's something called the Erstat law that preempts cities from doing that. So I don't think we should be afraid to scale up. And this is also a time where, uh, where there's a national election. And so uh, housing issues are a national issue, not just a local issue. And there's real strength in cities talking to each other. And the tenant union here in Kingston, you know, joining into the uh, Housing Justice for All coalition, which is statewide. But there's also the LA Tenants Union, and there's organizing going on in, in Boston and in Minneapolis and Chicago. And um, these tenant unions can be linked up in a way that builds power rather than takes away from it. So ultimately, I think we need to be organizing at both our jobs and our homes to do both at the same time. We need to be unionizing. We need to be building up cooperatives of um, you know, housing cooperatives, limited equity cooperatives, and also worker-owned cooperatives so that we can have more control over our economy as well. And so doing those two things at the same time, yes, at the local level, but always tied into those larger scales. Because if we create the perfect conditions in any one city, capital will leave. And that's the ultimate power of, of capital is the strike. Just like it's our power to go on rent strike or to go on strike at the workplace, capital can go on strike and refuse to invest in the place. And then we have trouble, right? It's not end, the end times or anything like that, but it's hard. And so if we can scale up, we'll be um, in a better position to prevent that from happening. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Juanita, and I'm one the founder of the Kingston Tenant Union. Thank you all for coming out. And I thank Alex, Red C, and Fox for putting this all together. And most definitely you, Samuel Stein, for coming out. My question to you, which I believe I already know the answer, but I'm not going to accept, okay, is where do we find common ground? And could there be a common ground? Right. Depends what we mean by common ground and who we mean by we. Um, right? Between we, between the real estate, the people who are Got who are buying, you know, the our owners, our landlords, yes. and the tenants. How do we get where everyone will at least treat each other with humanity and come into a common ground and believe that everyone deserves a place to live? Only by building up our power as tenants, our power as residents, and our power as workers. It's never going to happen because they want to be nice. It's only going to be happen because they're afraid of us, they're afraid of their bottom line, or they're afraid of being reelected. And so, you know, the kind of organizing that will actually bring everybody together is the very organizing that those people will tell you that you shouldn't do, right? They'll tell you that we should all come together right now. No, 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 we will come together when we force you to come to our table rather than you inviting us to your table. I like that answer. I like the boss to come to my table. <laughs> well, good evening. I also wanted to say, please pick up his book, Capital City, and read. Um, also, I wanted to give a couple of announcements. Um, I wanted to say thank you also to our common council, our mayors and our aldermen. They have been working very hard with us, the Kingston Tenant Union, and many other organizations here in Kingston to try to come to a common ground, okay? They did not want to see this little Puerto Rican yelling up in their office anymore. That was for sure, okay? Um, so I really want to give a big shout out to all of them who have came together and understood where the problem is. Um, we want Kingston to grow. But we're telling you that the only thing is the people who are actually working it for you to make it grow are the people you're pushing out. Okay, the workers who are digging the grounds, okay, and putting in the streets, okay, after they put it in, you go and raise the rents, they're not gonna be able to live here no more. But yet they're the ones that built it. Okay, this country has been built on the backs of low income or slaves from the beginning. Now I'm gonna say that, okay? And they did not get any part of the wealth. All I'm saying is somewhere, somewhere, sometime, we have to come to a common ground. Not for us, because most of us here have lived most of our lives, but guess what? How, how many here have grandchildren or great-grandchildren? That's who we are talking about. That's why we're fighting for this, because they're the ones that are gonna be left here to deal with the mess that we all made where there is no common ground, okay? 
And if you have it, I mean, that humanity that I believe is in everyone, I think we will be able to come to a common ground. And we also, from the Kingston's Tenant Union, we have an EPTA petition that we hope you all would sign. Even if you are not a tenant, support us. Because being a homeowner, you know, if we, like I said, common ground. We help each other's neighbors. I mean, I grew up back in the city, but we all were, we knew each other's neighbors. And if your kid did something wrong, before you got home, your mama knew. Okay? And we didn't have cell phones back then. Okay? Where did that go? Where did that go? How many people go out and throw out their garbage and don't know their neighbor across the street? Let's get together because I believe we can live together. And instead of fighting, you know, I don't want you to hear me yelling, but that's for you. <laughs> Thank you, Juanita. That's it. So, uh, bye, Sam's book. And thank you very much for coming out.